You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, listeners, and welcome to episode 110 of the Common Descent Podcast. Today, we are once again turning our focus to a fossil deposit of note. This time, the Maison Creek fossil beds of Illinois, here in the United States, possibly, uh, certainly among the most famous Carboniferous fossil deposits in the world. Cool. Absolutely full of very cool fossils. Uh, Back during the early days of modern-ish looking ecosystems, the Maison Creek fossil beds are exciting, not only because they preserve a lot of cool stuff, but if we can be a little bit selfish <laughs> and some home country pride, this is a real cool fossil site, and it's right here in our country of the United States. I'm so excited to learn about it because I've heard this name just all around, but I don't actually know much about this site, so mm-hmm. I'm, I'm eager to learn. Yeah, it's it's quite famous and and it's it's almost difficult to narrow down how to talk about it because there's so much as we'll get into. So we're going to talk about what the site is, what makes it unique. We'll talk about the human history and the geologic history, and then we'll talk a bunch about the fossils that are found there. And of course, for anyone out there who has heard of Maison Creek, odds are you've heard of it for the specific creature we will spend some time talking about at the end. <laughs> The Tully Monster. Yeah. Uh, state fossil of Illinois and just the, the, a super bizarre, utterly weird animal. Good name, too. This episode topic was requested. Request. As is the case with all of our episodes these days, uh, for most of the podcast, by Lori, Cheryl, and David. Thank you to all three of you for uh, this request. That's not me, David. This is another David. Yes. All three of those people were patrons at the time of requesting. So thanks for that. Yeah. Good request. And speaking of patrons, uh, we have a Patreon and the podcast is funded entirely Mm -hmm. by donations we get on a Common Descent podcast Patreon. That means we are able to host the podcast. We're able to buy cool equipment, handy equipment for what we're trying to do. Uh, It allows us to offset some of the costs, uh, in fact, all of the costs of doing this podcast. Patrons get all sorts of goodies, including if you sign up at a certain level. Uh, We will shout your name out in gratitude. This episode, we would like to welcome Miranda. Thanks, Miranda. Thanks for joining us. Thanks to all of our patrons. One of the other goodies you get is the ability to ask us patron questions. Stay tuned for the end of the episode. We've only got one other announcement this time around. Uh, It is uh, the end of March Mm -hmm. as of the recording of this episode, which means that between this recording and the release of this episode, we will have watched Godzilla vs. Kong. I'm so excited. And we are. We don't know what it's going to look like, but Mm -hmm. we will do some sort of silver screen science episode following up our viewing of this movie. Uh, kicking all, you know, t- uh, following up from where we did our Kaiju, Godzilla, and King Kong Silver Screen Science series a while back. Yeah, we will have a response. There will be something. <laughs> hopefully, <laughs> a glowing good response. Well, and hopefully there'll be lots of fun science. Yeah, an interesting, yeah. insightful response. Yeah, so keep your eyes out for that. That should be coming out in the coming weeks or so. Other than that, we hope everybody out there is staying safe and healthy. Uh, I myself just got my second uh, COVID vaccination shot yesterday, and boy, did it take its toll on me. <laughs> uh, oh, I have been immune responsing all day. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, the second the second shot got me, got me pretty good. So, uh, if I sound at all sluggish during this episode... Uh, that's the reason why. <laughs> uh, also, please accept that as a blanket excuse to explain away any mistakes or stumbles that I make in this episode. Uh, Pfizer made me do it. I plan to get vaccinated before every episode now. That's right. <laughs> uh, this episode, all of Will's mistakes are natural. <laughs> like usual. <laughs> well, that's enough of that. Let's move on to the news. Every episode, we like to start off by looking at some of the recent news and the sciences that interest us and interest our listeners, presumably paleontological, evolutionary, biological, etc. Will start us off with some news. 
My first news has been making the rounds aggressively in the paleo art community, so you may have seen pictures of this already. This is about the winged shark from the Cretaceous that has been discovered recently. Uh, yes, I did see this. So this is a ancient shark with long wing-like fins and is just super weird. Right, but not quite like a manta ray. No, it's it's just weird. It's different and weird in a lot of ways. So we'll go through the features. This is research by Romain Volo et al. in Science, and the article is by Laura Gegel in Live Science. So this is a fossil from found in Mexico, about 93 million years old. Cretaceous. This shark is named Aquilo Lamna Milarque, which means the eagle shark of the Milarca Museum, which okay. is where it's going to be housed. Eagle shark. Right? Cool. Yeah, that's what it's been like was colloquially being called in all of the posts I was seeing, just the, the catchy name. And I was like, oh, yeah, catchy name. No, it is the eagle shark. Oh, that, I wonder if the catchy name came first. Yeah, that, right. That's what happened with Beelzebufo and, as we will learn later, the Tully Monster. Oh. Yeah, they cool. got the nickname and then the scientific name was crafted to reflect it. Yeah, I mean, if you get a catchy name, you can't just say no to it. Yeah. This is a shark. The tail is very shark-like, so we're good there. The face is flattened it does not have a long face and then the pectoral fins where the arms would be on us the front fins the front fins the side ones elongate out into these big blade like wings Hmm. not wide like you were saying with a manta ray or a stingray or devil rays like an airplane wing yeah like a long like a glider wing you know like when you think of the those low energy glider planes and this is all Especially weird because it's not related to mantas and uh, the other rays with wings like this. Because it was around about 30 million years before those kinds of rays were around. So it's not it's not that group. Huh. It seems to be convergently ha- have evolved wing-like pectoral fins. It's just another group of sharks that did big long wings. Yep. Except maybe in a different way or maybe it was using them differently. It doesn't seem to be one-to-one. Hmm. They think it was likely a filter feeder because it has that flattened face, which the manta rays have a flattened wide face for filter feeding. Mm -hmm. It seems like it likely lived in a similar environment to those kinds of filter feeders we see today. So that was probably occupying a similar space at least. So it could be therefore living a similar way. This is, it was well preserved in a piece of limestone, which not only preserved the, uh, much of the skeletal material, which is. Un, and you're not common for sharks, so awesome find. Excellent. But also imprints of some of the soft tissue. Nice. So very good fossil. This was from the Western Interior Seaway, which covered the mid of North America. Yeah, where all the best stuff lived. Yeah. We'll learn so, more about that in episode 71, and the best animals of the Western Interior Seaway in episode 51. But I, you can go to episode 48, I guess, if you want to <laughs> learn about sharks. <laughs> and this was a section of Mexico that was covered by it, where it was found. Eh, gotcha. All in all, size-wise, it is not a small shark, but it's not huge. Uh, total body length is a little more than five feet, you know, just uh, almost five and a half, so um, 1.6 meters. But it's wider than it is long. So it's wingspan. <laughs> it's oh, well, wings. Well, sorry, quote, unquote. It's fin span. Fin span. <laughs> tip to tip. <laughs> is over six feet long, just about two meters. Weird. So it... Why? Right? The tail seems to be pretty normal, like a shark's tail. So it seems to have a functional shark's tail along with these long wings, Mm -hmm. which is not what we see in the other winged elasmobranchs, the group that includes sharks and rays. Right. Uh, Manta rays and such do not have shark-like tails, to my knowledge. Little thin uh, uh, stick of a tail, Mm -hmm. and it's just used for maybe steering, but... Really, it's not functioning in their swimming at all. Right. Because uh, most sharks, like most fish, are propelling themselves mm-hmm. with the tail. The tail is your thruster, and the fins are for steering, whereas with a manta ray, the opposite is true. Those big wing-like pectoral fins are what you're using to move yourself along, whereas the tail might be acting as a rudder. Exactly. And so this seems like it may have been using powered tail swimming And then maybe the fins were used for lift, like to keep it up in the water. So it wasn't using much energy. Yeah. Yeah, It was basically pushing itself and then the wings were lifting, but it was maybe not flapping with the fins. 
Okay. Like so, manta rays are. Like an airplane, mm-hmm. where you, uh, you get the right angle of attack, and you just naturally attain, achieve li- upward movement. Mo- <laughs> Told you about that vaccine. <laughs> but it could have been doing some flapping. We don't know. So it looks like it was doing something different, which is notable because there are filter feeders on both sides of the elasma ranks. You have the ray filter feeders like manta rays, and then you have filter feeders like whale sharks. Mm-hmm. This seems like it may have been doing something in between. With wings like a ray, but a tail like a shark. And so if it was a filter feeder, it was a different model of shark filter feeder convergently between the two. Cool. Right? Just a super weird animal. Now, something also interesting and weird about it. So it seems to have a normal shark tail with a normal shark caudal fin, the tail fin. And it's got those two big pectoral fins. It doesn't seem like it had pelvic back fins. And we don't know whether it had a dorsal fin. Hmm. It doesn't have one preserved, but it could have just not preserved. Right. But it sure does seem not to have pelvic fins. So okay. it may have been reduced in the number of fins it had. Oh, it's got, there's enough fin in those pectorals right? to go around. And none of the shark's teeth were preserved. Mm. If it had teeth, they weren't preserved, which means it's difficult to place this shark confidently in a group because that's what we use typically to play sharks in shark groups right to identify it because that's usually what preserves from sharks yeah it's super weird to get a shark with a bunch of soft tissue and no teeth yes that's that is an opposite shark currently it is placed with the lamniforms which includes a bunch of different sharks but your goblin shark your mega mouth your mako your great white are all in this group so Mm -hmm. currently it is in that umbrella but when we find hopefully more specimens with toothy material we might be able to refine that the researchers might be able to refine that i like this idea of a shark that was doing a little bit of the ray thing and a little bit of the whale shark thing before either of those evolved right that it it, they were already experimenting with the pieces that would later become very successful in those other two uh functional groups Mm -hmm. yeah it's and it's one of those where you I just want to see how it was moving. Like, how did something... Because when you see rays move, they move in such a, a, a strange but majestic, graceful way. Yeah. What was this weird thing? Was it like a kite? Was it just gliding slowly through the water? Like, oh, I want to know. Yeah. It's it's cool to get... every. Uh, we talk about this a lot in paleontology, about finding extinct animals that we don't have a good modern comparison mm-hmm. for. It's weird to think about one where we can say this is absolutely, positively, definitely a shark, and we have no comparison. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Very strange. Yeah, we may even get to the point where we can confidently place it in the, the, the group of sharks, like who it's related to, and still we won't know. Well, speaking of Cretaceous things and functional morphology, uh, examining the structure of the body to interpret habits, my first bit of news is about a newly discovered ankylosaur from the Cretaceous of Mongolia, whose features have researchers thinking about the potential digging adaptations of armored dinosaurs. Neat. Yeah, this is research in the journal Scientific Reports by Jin Young Park et al. And in our blog post, every episode has a blog post with a bunch of extra stuff, we will link to an article in Gizmodo by Isaac Schultz. The new ankylosaurs, so ankylosaurs, episode 69, are the group of four-legged uh, herbivorous dinosaur, well, typical four-legged mostly, herbivorous dinosaurs covered in armor. Dino tanks. The dino tanks covered in bumps and spikes and spines, sometimes with clubs on their tails. Very cool group. This new ankylosaur comes from the late Cretaceous, about 70 million years ago, so very late Cretaceous, from the Gobi Desert of Mongolia. It has been identified as an ankylosaurid. So back in episode 69, we discussed that there are two major groups of later derived ankylosaurs, the ankylosaurids, which typically have clubs on their tails and lots of bumps and spikes. It's what it, I think it's probably the more traditional, what you typically seen, right. pic, see pictured as an- ankylosaurs. Ankylosaurus. Exactly. Is and the notosaurs, which t- typically do not have clubs and oftentimes might have smoother armor, though they also would get spikes. Yeah, they have like blades down the side and stuff. It's cool. This ankylosaur from this region is exciting because most of the ankylosaurs known from this area, there are several, are only known from skulls. 
Mm -hmm. which means we don't know a lot about their bodies. Sort of the opposite of the sauropod situation. (laughs) Episode 101. This one has an articulated postcrania, which means rest of the body in position. So in roughly and not a jumble, but in the shape of the original body, including the backbone, ribs, uh, front and back legs, the pectoral and pelvic girdles, and lots of osteoderms, the armored skin bones. The researchers were not able to identify it to a genus or species. I assume, I didn't actually read this, but I assume because they don't have the skull. Mm -hmm. And that's what we use to identify these a lot of the time. The specimen was discovered during fieldwork back in the 1970s, but was unable to be excavated then. And so in 2008, researchers were finally able to go back and get it. Comparing it with other ankylosaurs led them to notice that Asian ankylosaurs seem to have a few shared features, including particularly rigid bodies. So all ankylosaurs are are tank-like, but these have extra bits of fusion. They're particularly sturdy and fewer toes. Hmm. If I interpreted what I read correctly, it sounds like they have three toes. Okay. Instead of the typical dinosaurian uh, five uh, in, in a lot of the herbivores. And overall, the researchers suspect that a lot of the features they're seeing in these Asian ankylosaurs look suspiciously like digging adaptations. So they have flattened and fusiform bodies. So they're sort of tapered at both ends and flattened top to bottom. Lots of fusion in the vertebrae, broad ribs, big upper arm bones and short lower arm bones with a well-developed muscular crest on the humerus. And uh, and any functional morphology people out there uh, will perk up at this. The olecranon process, which is the part at the elbow that sticks back off of the ulna. So your lower arm bone continues a little bit past the elbow to curve around. Mm -hmm. A well-developed olecranon process, which we see in a lot of swimmers as well as diggers. And they point out that these ankylosaurs have fewer toes and a slight curve to the toes, which gives their hands this trowel sort of shape. Huh. So their their point is to say, yeah, they've got a lot of things that look strangely like Stuff we see in burrowers. But they don't think ankylosaurs were burrowing. Yeah. Because a lot of them were very big. I was about to say. (laughs) Which, there were big sloths Mm -hmm. who burrowed, but there's no dinosaur-sized paleo burrows. There's no evidence of that. Plus, they make the point that I thought was interesting. They have long, rigid tails, which is not what you want. When it's just straight burrows. Yeah, digging through the ground. (laughs) They have to pick their angle, and then they just go down. So it could be that they're using these adaptations to dig nests. Um, I think I think it was Rebecca Hunt Foster who was cited in the article as pointing out that elephants will dig for water and minerals. But the authors make the point that the shape of the body is kind of similar to phrynosomatid lizards, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which are the horned lizards that we have here in North America that tend to have very flat bodies, spines sticking out of the sides. And when trying to protect themselves, will flatten themselves against the ground, Mm -hmm. which makes them difficult to see, uh, also difficult to move. And sometimes they will partially bury themselves. They'll dig a little bit and put themselves in a little trough. So the authors are suggesting maybe, now this is a maybe, of course, because we're making interpretations of unusual behavior. We're getting speculative. Yep. They uh, are evoking an image of ankylosaurs digging a little trench and then hunkering their belly down in it with their spikes out to the side so that predators can't have a hard time seeing them, but also getting at them. Yep. That that soft belly that would be your weak spot is now buried, basically. Yeah. And your legs and all that. They also point out that baby ankylosaurs don't have as extensive armor. Mm -hmm, So this mm -hmm. could also be something handy for babies. They could have been, uh, they make the comparison to armadillos. Yeah. You know, maybe they're going into burrows. Maybe they're doing some digging. Yeah. Interesting. It's always bizarre when we find a feature on an extinct animal that like we're, we're recognizing all the patterns. It's like, we've got fusion in the body. We've got reinforced limb, you know, front limb bones. We've got curved claw, like digger, digger, digger. All the boxes are being checked, but then it's on an animal that really doesn't seem to fit the lifestyle. And, you know, this has happened with others where it's like it 
they have these features, but we don't know how they'd be doing that thing that they have features for. And I always, I, I love when it happens because it, you know, the point that's like, yeah, well, elephants do dig. They don't dig like a mole does, mm-hmm. but they will mine with their tusks and stuff and they will get down into the dirt. So it it's fun because it, it forces us to reframe the way we look at these animals. There's a, now a new behavior that they might be incorporating into their lifestyle that you wouldn't expect a giant multi-ton tank to be doing. Yeah. So it's a cool... It. I'll be very curious to see future discussion about this. Mm-hmm. And say, can we get a little bit... Is this just ridiculous? Yeah. Or are they really doing something that we didn't expect them to be doing? I mean, were they, were they an underground food specialist? Were they just, like, uprooting areas? Oh, yeah. And I've heard that about them, mm-hmm. that they might have been going for low vegetation and maybe roots and stuff. <laughs> were, were, like, how wild hogs just tear up forest area. Did ankylosaurs come through an area and the ground just got troweled? Yeah. Ooh, I like that. Right? Very neat. Well, for my next bit of news, I'm going back to the ocean. Okay, fine. To talk about potentially very old cephalopods. Ooh. These are fossils that, if they are indeed cephalopods, or representing cephalopods, push the origin of the group back farther than we realized. Enough to be kind of a big deal. Cool. So we talked about cephalopods back in episode 16. Mm Mm-hmm. This is your squids, octopuses... Uh, nautiluses and ammonites yeah among you know belemnites and all the other extinct stuff this is research by ann hindenbrand et al in the communication biology and the article is by david neild in science alert so cephalopod cephalopoda the group that includes all of these suction cupped armed uh, soft body creatures yeah. cthulhu creatures yeah as we traditionally knew them you know from our most of our evidence showed up just shy of 500 million years ago, 490 million years ago. Okay. Late Cambrian. That's when we see the first cone shelled, what seemed to be ancestors of our cephalopods because they started out shelled. Many fossil groups are shelled. The Nautilus today is shelled. All the rest have either lost or internalized the shell to some degree. Right. These fossils, which are also little cone-esque sh- shells, date back to about 522 million years old. That's older. That's 30 million years older than we thought cephalopods existed. Yeah. Which is enough to really kind of shake up our understanding of what the ocean was doing and what the ecosystem was doing around this time. Mm-hmm. Because cephalopods were a big deal when they showed up in the ocean. Yes. They, they very quickly became a very big deal. Yes. So these fossils were found in... The Avalon Peninsula in Newfoundland, Canada. Now, these fossils are interesting because they are not definitively cephalopod. Right. As is so often the case with very early stuff. Exactly. They have some telltale features that could place them within cephalopoda. So there's an argument for them to be cephalopods, but there's still going to need to be research to confirm it. One of the things uh, that it makes it kind of ambiguous is... In many of the shelled fossils for cephalopods, there's a sign of a spiracle, which is the tube that comes off of cephalopods that lets them push water out of their body. And it's how squids and cuttlefish and octopus jet around the water. And so that spiracle, there's usually a sign of its presence on the shell, you know, somewhere in the features of the shell. These shells, some have it, not all do. Hmm. So it is not present on all of these new fossils, which could be that we're going far enough back that we're lacking that feature. Right. Or could be that it's because these aren't cephalopods, but other shells lacking that feature have been included in cephalopods before. So there is precedent for it to be potentially uh, still supportive. So there's debate. It's not definite. But the reason this is such a big deal is because if indeed these are 520 million year old cephalopods, that's going to rewrite the entire history, our understanding of the history of cephalopods and their origin, but also invertebrates in general, because this is one of the big groups of invertebrates. And if they showed up at a different time, that may adjust where they, you know, how their origin is related to other groups' origins. Mm Mm-hmm. For instance, this would mean that cephalopods emerged before certain eu arthropods, which includes insects and crustaceans. Mm-hmm. 
So it it's rewriting how we understood what the kind of uh, set groups were at that time. And so it could really have a domino effect down the line of understanding the dynamics of this group and others that they shared the habitats with. Interesting. I wonder if, as we learn more, if we'll find out that cephalopods became a big deal earlier, Mm -hmm. or if they were very rare for a while, and maybe they were in a big impact on their ecosystem, or was this something doing cephalopody things before or alongside the earliest true cephalopods? Yeah, and all these things are possible. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of the things they note is that part of the reason that cephalopods could be such a big deal information-wise for the environment is because they were one of the first organisms to start propelling themselves into the water column and floating with their shells. Okay. So they changed the face of the ocean in that way, that they were the first, one of the early groups to leave the ocean floor and start floating around in the water. And if organisms were doing that earlier than we thought, now that means that behavior showed up, which could change the whole food chain and uh, power system of the ecosystems. So now it's really just looking for more specimens or further research to verify or deny whether or not these are cephalopods. I feel like either way it's exciting. Yes, oh absolutely. So in, in, either these are earlier cephalopods or things doing cephalopod like things before true cephalopods took off. A part of the Cambrian experimentation. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cool either way. Very cool. Well, I'm going to stick with the theme of invertebrates for my second bit of news and talk about a fly. All right. This is a fossilized fly with unusual and rare gut contents. Ooh. Yeah, this is research by Sonia Wedman et al. in Current Biology, and we will link to an article in Science Alert by Carly Casella. Nemestrinidae is the family of what are called tangle-veined flies. (laughs) This is a group of flies. There are many, 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 many groups of flies. Don't ask me to describe what tangle vein flies are special for. I don't know. They are a group of flies. Their veins are tangled. But today, there are about 300 living species, which sounds like I am not a fly expert, but that sure sounds like a small group of flies. I mean, that sounds like numbers that... (laughs) That sounds like the correct realm of numbers that we deal with when we start dealing with flies. Yeah, it sounds one digit too few. Yes, it does. uh, For a fly (laughs) family. Uh, Their larvae are apparently endoparasitoids in grasshoppers and beetles, meaning they chestburster out of them. Uh, There are tangle vein flies with long proboscises, the suckers on the nose, and short proboscises. Their fossils are known from the Jurassic to the Eocene. We have decent representation of them. 25 extinct species, mostly from the Mesozoic. So mostly older fossils. This new specimen comes from Messel, Germany, from the Eocene, about 47 and a half million years ago, it is this lovely impression of a fossil fly about 11 millimeters long, just smushed between the layers, that preserves 3D structures, specifically a 3D sort of pocket in the abdomen that is full of fossilized pollen. Ooh. Which the researchers suspect might be a crop. Birds have their own version of a crop. Uh, some other dinosaurs are thought to have had a similar structure. It's it's like an internal version of uh, hamster cheeks. It's yeah. It's storing. You store food before it moves on to digestion. They were able to identify the fly as belonging to a modern genus, Hermonura, and the new species, Hermonura mesalensi. It is a short proboscis, nemestrinid fly. Inside the gut, uh, this is the exciting part, pollen in gut contents apparently is extremely rare. Really? That is something that we have not found very much, uh, at least in insects. And this part's cool. According to the paper, no tangle vein flies are known to eat pollen, living or extinct. Whoa. This is potentially the first known species of this family from almost 50 million years ago known to eat pollen. They were able to identify the pollen. They they identified at least four different plant families, uh, including... Decadon, which is water willow, and Parthenocissus, which are vines that include, for example, Virginia creeper. The fact that there's a variety of pollen uh, led them to suggest that these flies were probably generalists, hopping from plant to plant, gobbling up some pollen, and that they're probably important pollinators. Mm -hmm. They noted that the abdomen and thorax, so the body of the fly, were covered in little hairs, uh, which in insects we call setae, that didn't have pollen on them in the fossil, 
but could certainly act as pollen collectors. We see those in bees and in flies today. Those little hairs will pick up pollen that then they're carrying from flower to flower. They also point out that uh, because these are short proboscis flies, they probably had to land on plants to feed from them. They couldn't hover and slurp up nectar. Exactly, like a hummingbird. Like a hummingbird, yep, or like a butterfly. This is all fascinating in the broader context because today, flies are extremely important pollinators. Yes. You know, we think about bees, and yes, absolutely, bees deserve that renown. They are good, they are awesome, they do a good job. But... Flies, I've seen some places that suggest that flies are second to bees in their pollination capacity, and apparently there have even been some scientists who have suggested that in certain environments, particularly tropical environments today, flies might be more important pollinators than bees. Which really isn't surprising, because it's flies. They're everywhere, and there's billions of them. Of, Of course, I'd assume they're pollinating plants by accident. Oh, yeah. Just through to the mass amount of them, <laughs> they're going to bump into plants and pollinate every now and then. This fossil suggests that the importance of flies for pollination might go back at least 50 million years. And this is a really cool example where this fossil does not just tell us about ancient ecosystems. It also hints at modern ecosystems. Because according to the researchers, we don't know much about the diets of modern-day short proboscis tangle vein flies. So they could be doing this, we just might not have observed it. It's possible we they are eating pollen today and we don't know that. Which, uh, whether they're doing it or not, the authors point out that this could mean that this family of flies might be underappreciated pollinators today. Which is a very cool... It is very rare... Not unheard of, but very rare that a fossil Mm -hmm. tells you something potentially interesting about what living animals are doing. Yeah, that we learn something new about an extant group because we finally, we noticed it first (laughs) in a fossil relative. Yeah. That's exciting. That's also just very cool, like, gut contents in a fly. Right. Wow. That's such a tiny gut. And the fact that that we were able to find and observe that. It's, we are <laughs> thinking machine supercomputers. <laughs> like, it, we are in the future. It's awesome. I love that we're able to find that level of detail yeah. in fossils when they're when they're preserved like this. Yeah, this is an 11 millimeter long fly. And I, I, they probably have it in the paper. So imagine how small that potential crop is. Yeah. And loaded with pollen. Oh, that's it's just, it, it's such a fascinating find that you could easily not notice even if you were looking for it. Yeah. <laughs> like you could, I could absolutely accidentally pass over this fly. Very cool. Well, it's funny because I saw the pictures of the fly and I absolutely could have passed over mm-hmm. it. It looks like a smushed fly, which is to say not immediately recognizable as a fly to me yes. at least. Yep, yep, <laughs> yep. Wow. Well, speaking of exceptional preservation, what do you say we take a break? And then when we come back, we will discuss the feature presentation of the episode, The Maison Creek Fossil Beds of Illinois. Let's! Some fossil sites are famous because of just how many fossils they have. Mm -hmm. Some fossil sites are famous because particularly famous fossils come from that site. And some fossil sites are famous because of the exceptional preservation at the site. Yes. Maison Creek is famous for all three reasons. Triple threat. Maison Creek is a series of fossil deposits in northeastern Illinois. And Maison Creek is a conservat lagerstätte, which means a fossil site of exceptional preservation. Lagerstätte is a word that is also used to refer to sites like the Burgess Shale, uh, the Messel Pit in Germany. The Gray Fossil Site has been referred to as a Lagerstätte for exceptional preservation. Neat. At Maison Creek, we find fossils, uh, exceptional preservation not just of hard body parts, but also soft body parts. Very much like the Burgess Shale. Go back to episode 89, learn all about that. But unlike the Burgess Shale, Maison Creek's fossils date back to the late Carboniferous period. Whereas Burgess Shale is Cambrian, this is late Carboniferous, 
and it is among the most diverse sites from this time period. Wow. Now, a quick note. Maison Creek, the fossil beds are named after the creek, Maison Creek or Maison River, at which the fossils were first noticed. I do not, I have heard the name Maison Creek pronounced in a number of different ways. I'm pretty sure I've heard it pronounced Maison. Um, I think I read one paper that suggested that the, uh, the, the traditional pronunciation should be something like Maison. Hey, that's what I was going to say jokingly. Yeah. <laughs> but... I have it on reasonably good authority that the locals in Illinois call it Maison Creek. That's what I usually hear. That's what I hear. That's what geologists tend to call it. Uh, I asked our friend Chris Widga, who was an Illinoisan for a long time uh, (laughs) working at the museum up there. So uh, for the handful of people that may be out there upset about it, please twitching every time, direct all of your complaints to our good friend, Dr. Chris Widga. (laughs) <laughs> don't actually do that he's a very nice guy uh send so us... be polite when you do it <laughs> say please direct all your hate mail to common podcast at gmail.com <laughs> unlike a lot of other famous so we've covered uh, uh sites like the gray fossil site mm-hmm. which is a single site you know you fly a drone up above it and you can see the entirety of the deposit of the gray fossil site yeah, from the balcony of the museum you can basically point to all of it yes maison creek is an ex extensive region that that goes across several counties in northeast illinois covering a space of some 150 square kilometers this is a massive extensive deposit from which tens of millions of fossils have been collected including all sorts of cool things insects jellyfish early amphibians and reptiles crustaceans weird stuff The Tully Monster, uh, very famously. More on that later. The age of the site, as I mentioned, is late Carboniferous. We are in the Pennsylvanian period, around 310-ish million years ago. This was The Carboniferous period is famous for being the time where land plants really hit their stride. This time period, we see extensive swamps and forests. This is why so many of the world's most prolific coal beds date back to this time. Coal is made of the plants from those swamps and forests. Mm -hmm. This is also a time where we see the flourishing of somewhat familiar looking land ecosystems, including some of the earliest insect ecosystems and amniotes show up around this time. The first ancestors of reptiles and mammals. Geographically, over the course of the Carboniferous, we see the formation of Pangaea. All the continents come together. This is also a time where, and in the later Carboniferous, we see a series of glacial events. Polar glaciation, especially in the south, which is linked to fluctuations in climate and sea level, which we will mention again here in a bit. But in case you're thinking, oh, I wonder what Illinois was like up in the temperate zone back during this time period, it wasn't. (laughs) The Maison Creek fossil beds... Uh, at this time, were a few degrees off of the equator. So this was a tropical environment. A bit warm. A bit toasty. We'll talk a bit more about the geologic history of the site in a little bit, but let's talk about the human history of it. Because, as with many fossil sites, the story of its discovery and exploration is really cool. Maison Creek fossils have been known since the mid-1800s, uh, starting with fossils found along the banks of Maison Creek, or Maison River, which is a tributary of the Illinois River. Okay. The earliest publications, according to what I read, of fossil material from Maison Creek fossil deposits began in the 1850s. And even all the way back then, it was recognized as a place of exceptional preservation. Really nice fossils. Even in the early days of paleontology as we know it, people were like, well, hot dang, (laughs) there's some cool fossils here. (laughs) Many... Lagerstata, many very well-preserved fossil sites, represent limited habitats. So, like I said, the Gray Fossil Site is a pond. Yeah, it is this watering hole. That, that's what it is. Maison Creek is this extensive deposit that captures multiple communities from a range of habitats. And this is also something that it has become famous for, that even back in the 1800s, paleontologists were recognizing that we are seeing multiple habitats of 
fossil plants and animals in this deposit. Maison Creek fossils are found, so the actual beds are a sizable geologic deposit called the Francis Creek Shale, which is a member, so part of, the Carbondale Formation. So a deposit, so picture your geologic layers, of shale, silts, and muds and stuff. And underneath it is the Colchester Coal, a very extensive and very rich coal deposit. Okay. That spans across multiple states. This is a a very popular place for coal miners to go looking for coal. Well, starting in the early 1900s, miners began extensive strip mining and shaft mining of the Colchester coal. Uh, one reference that I read, I believe this was, uh, so my one of my big references for this episode is Clements et al. 2019, which gives a nice recent overview of the history of Maison Creek, and I'll link that in the blog post. I believe it was that reference that said, in that time, to- across the 1900s, over 83 shaft mines and 15 strip mines were opened up across several counties heading for the Colchester Coal. Oof. But the Francis Creek Shale is on top of it. So in order to get to the coal, they had to scoop up all this shale and dump it off to the side. Yep. So they they ended up creating these big piles of what to them was overburden, but which fossil collectors quickly realized were loaded with fossils. Yeah. So these spoil piles attracted paleontologists and fossil collectors... For many years, some people reportedly gathered thousands of fossils. And to this day, there are both museum and private collections full of Maison Creek fossils from just several counties worth of industrial grade uh, (laughs) piles. Getting this dirt out of here. Getting this dirt out of here. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Yeah. So big deal operations. Not looking for fossils. No. Just moving fossils. Yep, but had the side effect of exposing them for people to see. Apparently, most of these mines, the coal mines, were closed and backfilled towards the end of the 1900s, which means that there are relatively few places today that you can actually collect Maison Creek fossils, because Illinois is largely flat, so there's not a lot of exposures Mm -hmm. uh, to go to. And though the fossils do show up on the banks of Maison Creek, there's water, there's vegetation, some of that land belongs to people. Yep. So th- it's relatively limited where you can actually go to get these fossils, but lots of modern research on Maison Creek stuff is being done using the extensive collections in museums. Okay. Notably, the Field Museum and the Royal Ontario Museum have big collections of Maison Creek fossils. Also, at some point, I don't have it written down in front of me, but at some point, uh, the Maison Creek fossil beds were designated a nat- national historical landmark or natural landmark Thank of goodness. the state of Illinois. So recognized for, yeah, this is really cool. This tells us a lot of cool stuff about the past. It's uh, th- it's interesting because very often, as we talk about it, the Gray Fossil Site, very often when industry comes upon fossil sites like this, it's it's a tale of tragedy. Like that can happen. It's and then it was plowed through and ground up in the process, and we collected what we could, and who knows what we didn't. Right. Uh, like that happens very regularly, and so the fact that this is, I mean, I'm sure that that still did. Ha- like yeah, I mean, these were spoil piles. Yeah, I'm they sure that not lots... probably probably not being treated with uh, the utmost delicacy. Exactly. I'm sure lots of things did get destroyed, and that would. Huge amounts were lost, but it's a massive, massive, massive collection of fossils. So it was not destroyed. Right. So this is, yeah, this is a, a strangely upbeat. When it's And then coal miners came and dug up the fossil site, moved it away, and then filled in <laughs> afterwards. That sounds like yeah. the end of the story. Right. But it's not. And that's it's actually, actually the beginning of the story. Yeah. Which is, wow, Maison Creek. Yeah. it's It's got a... A fascinating human history, a mm-hmm. historical tale. Absolutely. Uh, also interesting is its geological tale. So I mentioned that it is part of this big deposit. So let's zoom in on what the geology actually is here. Geologic layers are laid down in, you know, beds. The Francis Creek Shale is a vast deposit of muds and silts, including lots of fossils. In some places, this bed of shale 
can be up to 25 meters thick from Whoa. top to bottom. This is not a small, like, like and like I said, over oh, more than 100 square kilometers. This is a vast geological deposit. It's a thick layer. The fossils are generally found in the lower several meters of the deposit. And underneath it, as I mentioned, is the Colchester Coal. That coal is the remnant of a of swampy forest near the coastline back at that time, dominated by ancient plants called lycopods. Over time, as the climate changed and sea level rose, that coal forest was drowned. Gotcha. And the area became a place where freshwater flow met a shallow inland sea. Oh. So uh, sea level rose. There was also a local increase in precipitation at this time that created a river delta. Yeah. That's what the Francis Creek Shale is. It is a vast river delta where water was flowing off of the continent and depositing along the coast of this inland sea. Oh, well, that's fantastic. We have this awesome, likely brackish water. Mm hmm. Oh, I'm a big fan of brackish water because of working in the Tampa Bay. Yep. Which is what we <laughs> talked about all the time. And the brackish water environments give you a cool mixture of fresh and sea life. And we will talk about that. Oh, I'm excited now. Uh, oh, I'm excited. And the fact that it was almost at the equator has led some to compare it to the Amazon River Delta. Makes sense. That this was a vast delta. So where the fresh water flows met the, uh, the sea. In a tropical environment. So this has been likened to the Amazon. Which really puts into perspective, you know, the the massive amounts of fossils and everything. So, well, yeah, if it, if this is an ancient Amazon river, then, okay, well, duh. <laughs> of course, yeah. of course it has massive amounts of fossils because of, just look at the Amazon. And that's really uh, something that I don't think we've mentioned very much on the podcast, is that a geologic formation, a bed, is not just one feature again the gray fossil site happens to be that yes pond that's what was here but at this site as you go from one end of the delta to the other the fossils and the sediment changes Mm -hmm. because you're farther inland over in this direction and you're farther coastal you know offshore over in this direction you slowly gradient from river to sea exactly uh this also this also means that what you're seeing in the deposit is a place where sediments are being carried to this delta. So a lot of your sediments are being washed toward the coast, as are your fossils. Oh, yeah. A lot of the plants that are found here are thought to be washed down the river, depositing at this big deltaic environment. Interesting. And that's not even the most notable thing about the fossils here. Oh, well, tell me. Very famously, the fossils of Maison Creek are typically found in nodules, these oh. hard concretions of rock. So if you've ever seen videos of someone finding uh, like a ball of rock and hitting it with a hammer and it cracks open and there's like a lovely trilobite or fern or something inside, that's the kind of thing we're talking about. These are siderite nodules, uh, iron carbonate, that typically form around fossils. Hmm. They are often spherical or uh, uh, oblate, Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes disc-shaped. And a classic way to find fossils in there is to smash it with a hammer. Yeah, so if if you've ever seen that and you're like, how did they know that was in there? It's because this is a known phenomenon. Yes. Like, if you're in this place, in these kinds of deposits, and you find one of these nodules, odds are there's decent chance something might be inside it. Yeah, and if you smash enough of them... And then they just show the video of the one when there's a yes. <laughs> it's it's not that I sense there's a fossil in here. No, I'm we kept this recording. And in fact, there is a episode of Brain Scoop on YouTube with Emily Grassley about the Maison Creek fossils, and she goes outside with one of the museum uh, staff members and smashes some of these nodules. And I, if I remember right, doesn't get anything. Yeah. But that video also shows something that I've seen mentioned in a couple of the references I, I found, that an alternative to smashing with a hammer, which is a bit... Uh, Dramatic. Brute forcey and <laughs> haphazard, <laughs> is that sometimes geologists will freeze the nodules. Oh. And then thaw them, and you get the freeze-thaw process that hopefully... The water seeps into the plane of weakness, which should be where there is a fossil 
separating the bed slightly. Yeah, where two layers meet, that that should be the weak point yes. that is able to be stressed apart by the freezing process. Yes. That's awesome. So sometimes they'll freeze them, apparently sometimes for years, to, to give the ice a chance to work its way in there and then take it out and smash it with a hammer and just, hope that it breaks open along that point. Just a, a smaller, more delicate hammer. <laughs> Dink. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the SpongeBob in the quartz. Dink. Yes, exactly. That's awesome. Yeah, it's really... I had not heard of that technique before. I want to freeze some nodules. Let's go. Let's go up to Illinois. We'll have Chris take us up there. Yeah. <laughs> So none of you send complaints to him now. Don't complain to Chris. No, <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. We need him to take us. Tell him how cool he is. <laughs> the exquisite soft tissue preservation of the Maison Creek fossils has been attributed probably to a rapid burial, which makes sense if you're in a deltaic environment. There's going to be lots of sediment flowing over there very often, but also possibly the chemistry of the surroundings helps to preserve them. The soft tissue that is preserved there includes organs very often. We'll get leaves, we'll get eyes. You can sometimes get entire soft-bodied animals. In fact, right, rather commonly, like worms and jellyfish, wow. which is very unusual. Oftentimes these are flat, basically stains in the, the beds. But sometimes you can get 3D structures. So sort of a, a small, but 3D, including not only parts of animals, but like fruiting bodies of plants. Ooh. You can get preserved in some semblance of their original structure. So this wonderful 3D uh, soft tissue preservation, typically the fossils are preserved along the bedding plane, which is to say the uh, sediment was being laid down layer by layer. The consecutive layers. And oftentimes the fossils are parallel with those layers, suggesting they laid down at the bottom and got buried. But they are not always like that. Sometimes they are against the bedding plane, which might suggest that they were smothered. Yeah. In like a particularly torrential pour of sediment. Interesting. One thing that's quite interesting I found about these concretions, these nodules they're found in, is that we apparently don't fully understand how they form. Hmm. So uh, they are iron carbonate. And I've seen it pointed out that land sediments could be rich in iron, carrying iron down to these waters. And that if the waters are low in sulfate, then instead of reacting to form pyrite, which you often will get, iron might react to form iron carbonate that can form these hard concretions. They are most common towards the shore, mm -hmm. not as common in the offshore section of these beds, which suggests that this was a feature of the shore, right, closer to the uh, input Closer to the freshwater source. Yeah, things coming from the land toward this area yes. uh, instead of stuff from the ocean yes. causing this. Interesting. And apparently the size and shape of these nodules is often related to the fossil inside. See, that's where I'm getting, like, the fact that they're forming weird stuff forms in, you know, rock all the time. Mm -hmm. Why around... The fossils. And it could very well be that the organisms are serving as a nucleus point. Yeah. That these minerals, as they're forming, are adhering to the fossil, to the to the organic to the remains. The body. The body. And then that's what they're forming around. That's odd. That's It's what's like, um, if you ever had those chemistry sets as a, as a kid where it's, here's a whole bunch of bags of mineral mixtures. Mm-hmm. Put it in water and then crystals will form, but you usually had to put something in there. Yeah, something for them to start adhering to. Something that would be a nice spot for it to start growing on and then all the rest of the crystals would grow onto that. Right. These, the, a, a dead body could be acting as that here. Yeah. Which makes perfect sense and also awesome. Oh, how cool is that? A naturally formed coffin. It's just, it's something dies and then just minerals seek it out yeah, just blah, 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 blah. encase it. This is also apparently how raindrops are thought to form. Oh yeah. That like a dust particle mm -hmm. or something in the air might be a place where water vapor condenses and then that gives you a greater area for more and more water vapor to condense and you eventually get a raindrop. I have heard, it's, it, this is the concept of the Mentos and the soda is that a rough, not the smooth Mentos, has so many nucleation sites that 
bubbles just form so rapidly, basically all the carbonation is released at once. Right. There's a lot of surface area mm -hmm. for your reaction to take place. And when you have a lumpy, irregular body, that's a real good thing for stuff to grow on and get a hold on. Yeah. Fascinating. The Clements et al. 2019 paper says... Thousands upon thousands of unopened concretions remain in many museum collections. Oh. And that they are continuing to be explored to this day. And the fact that you've got thousands and thousands of these things of all sorts of different creatures means that the Maison Creek fossil beds are not only great for finding fossils, but examining large-scale trends. Yes. Because you've got tons and tons of fossils. We actually can do population and ecosystem dynamics. Yes, you can study the ecosystem. You can study the range of habitats. You can study communities of organisms. And speaking of which, <laughs> uh, it's about dang time we got around to talking about what the fossils are at Who's this who? site. Who's who at the Maison Creek Fossil Beds. But first, we're going to take a short musical interlude uh, and then come back. Here is an incomplete list of <laughs> types of animal fossils that have been found in the Maison Creek fossil beds. Jellyfish, anemones, corals, ribbon worms, nematodes, velvet worms, Ooh. horseshoe crabs, sea spiders, millipedes, centipedes, insects, crustaceans, barnacles, slugs, and snails, bivalves, cephalopods, hey. uh, octopus squid uh, group, brachiopods, the things that aren't bivalves, Sea cucumbers, crinoids, jawless fish, ray finned fish, lobe finned fish, sharks, Woo. amphibians, and reptiles. Woo. Not to mention tons and tons of plants. <laughs> like all sorts of plants. According to Clemens et al. 2019, over 350 species of plants and over 465 species of animals have been identified from the Maison Creek fossil beds. Wow. Now, uh, you, we say that, that's those are big numbers, but also not really surprising. We've been excavating this place for going on two centuries now, and it's huge. Yeah, that is something that's notable that, you know, when you think of a fossil site, you tend to think of a few key things, but also, as you're saying, fossil sites often are a site. Right. You know, this area, you know, this, this fairly restricted stretch we know has fossils mm -hmm. we can fence it in here's a stretch of a state right you can't fence in six counties in illinois exactly you you would <laughs> some people would be very annoyed <laughs> if you tried and we've been there for a long time and a ton of it was exposed yes. due to its history yes so we've had an unusual amount of access to this fossil site it's like la brea yes yeah there, there's been tons of work over tons of time the plants of the site, so whereas underneath these beds, the Colchester Coal is full of lycopsids, which are ancient tree-like plants, Maison Creek's deposits are dominated by things like ferns, including seed ferns, uh, there's horsetails, there's all sorts of slightly more modern-looking groups of plants. There's those classic carboniferous plants. Yeah, tons of different animal species, some of which are unique to the Maison Creek beds, like the Tully Monster. And some of which are not necessarily unique, but the best representatives of their group. Uh, so like certain lampreys mm -hmm. are known from here. And they're, this, this is the place to go for those groups of animals. Traditionally, uh, the Maison Creek fossils have been considered in two separate faunas, two separate biotas. The braidwood fauna, or braidwood biota, which is mostly freshwater organisms and things from the land so things washed in from the land uh, this includes lots and lots of plants ferns horsetails etc uh, animals including insects myriapods which are your centipedes and millipedes occasional like reptiles and stuff most of which are probably those animals and plants being washed in Possibly sampling the entire drainage basin. Yeah, like, like who knows how far it. Yeah, these might not all be locals. <laughs> these could be coming a quite a distance. In with these braidwood uh, uh, biotas 
are also freshwater things like bivalves, so that's your clams and oysters and such, and amphibians. And as you would imagine, this biota is found more in the shoreward direction. The other traditional biota is the Essex biota, or Essex fauna, which is largely marine animals. Jellyfish, crustaceans, fishes, cephalopods, aquatic worms, uh, stuff like that, and as you might imagine, is typically found farther out, uh, oceanward in the geography of the site. How cool is it to just be able to get both of those habitats in one area? Right. Like that's that's super cool. Yeah. Now, I should point out that the Clements et al. paper argues that this this distinction, the Braidwood versus Essex, is not necessarily the case. Uh, I mentioned it because I saw it brought up quite a bit. It mm-hmm. looks like this is mm-hmm. how people have talked about it for a while. But Clements et al. argue that there's not really a clear distinction between freshwater and marine, that many of the animals we see in these aquatic habitats probably had uh t- could tolerate various salinity so they could have lived in an areas with high to low salt content so their suggestion is more likely what we're seeing is a whole brackish marine area yes. in this delta that it might be a bit more complex than just freshwater over here uh salt water over here absolutely because that's how environments like this are today Mm -hmm. like when you go when you're going down a river out to sea you don't just suddenly hit a hard line you're like all right no sharks no sharks no sharks look a shark right it it, sharks can absolutely come up a river they don't go very far because eventually they would die Mm -hmm. but yeah they can come into a river the way i explained it to people all the time when they were like can alligators go out in the ocean like yeah we can Mm mm-hmm if you stay out there, eventually you will die because right. there's too much salt. It will kill you because you'll be drinking the wrong water. Yes. But yeah, you can go swimming in the ocean. You can even swallow some of it as long as you don't swallow a lot of it. Yep. Animals absolutely could be going back and forth here. And so, which is even cooler to me. It's just this just yeah, this mixture. A melange. Yes. Well, and indeed, this paper points out that at river deltas today, what you end up getting is this torrent of fresh water and sediment into the nearby sea, which makes it a somewhat unique environment where a lot of animals don't live Mm -hmm. and can't survive. And they point out that over in the marine section, uh, or especially until you get far out into the, the oceanward area... These sediments are noticeably low in things like algae and sponges and trilobites and corals, which they suggest could be because this is an area where you're getting fluctuating salinity, lots of sediment being poured into the ocean, and certain animals are sensitive to those changes and wouldn't be able to survive there. Yeah, it, it you get this weird thing where in a brackish habitat... The ones who are fresh but can handle some salt can hang out there, and the ones who are salty and can handle some fresh can hang out there, but then the pure salt water and the pure fresh water can't. Right. So you get this weird mixture that's yeah. not not half and half, but a, a weird selection of both, which is awesome. It, that's a super cool thing to find. And speaking of weird stuff, I cannot sit here and just list things that have been discovered at this site. Uh, that would it is just too much. So I picked a few <laughs> things that I heard about along the way. It'll be, be like our history of the world. <laughs> the, the, yep. the geological Just scale. strap in <laughs> for the next two hours. Every second will be. <laughs> so here are some cool examples of things that have been identified at Maison Creek or features of the, the fossil biota that I found during my background research uh, to appease the vertebrate enthusiasts in, you know, the two of us. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cephalerpaton has been identified as one of the oldest true reptiles. Whoa. Possibly second only to Hylonymus from the Joggins site up in Nova Scotia. Wow. Uh, So we are seeing some of the earliest hints of reptiles, true reptiles. So the world's finally getting cool. Finally. (laughs) Took them long enough. (laughs) A 2019 paper identified Sroca larva berthii, as the oldest known larva of a holometabolin insect. Hmm. So if we go back to episode 81, uh, when we talked about metamorphosis, we'll explain to us what holometaboly means for a metamorphosing insect, that complete metamorphosis. Yes, that this is 
what we think of when you think of metamorphosis. Larva, pupa, or, or chrysalis, mm-hmm. or cocoon, or whatever, and then adult. Caterpillar, cocoon, chrysalis, butterfly. Uh, this one, uh, stroke of larva, looks caterpillar-like, apparently. Huh. And as we discussed in episode 99 about insect evolution... The evolution of complete metamorphosis was a major step in insect evolution because it gave rise to most of the modern diversity of insects. So here at Maison Creek, we are seeing hints of the earliest complete metamorphosing insects. That's a big deal. It's pretty cool. Maison Creek also apparently, uh, this I think was also in the Clemens paper, includes some of the oldest fossil evidence of possible crypsis. Hmm. There are a few animals, uh, particularly arthropods, that have features that look very similar to the plants that are found there. (laughs) That we might be seeing some of the oldest evidence of bugs evolving to look like plants to hide. Which makes complete sense. Like this is, this the Carboniferous is famous for being when we see the first kind of what we would recognize as land ecosystems with forests and insects and arthropods and Mm -hmm. predators milling around. So yeah, of course... There'd be things having to blend in and hide. Yeah. And it makes sense that they'd be looking like the plants, but wow! Yeah. Apparently, I didn't get its name, but there is at least uh, one cockroach-like species back then whose wings look like ferns. <laughs> awesome. Another interesting thing, uh, moving into the ocean, is that there are apparently lots of juvenile fish and sharks here which has led to the suggestion that this may have been acting as a nursery. Mm -hmm. That you might get lots of little ones. Very common in brackish ecosystems. Yep. And that also makes this a great place to study ontogeny. Yeah. Growth series from young to adult. We have uh, fossils of young fish to old fish. And this is something I know you will appreciate. Apparently, the Maison Creek fossil beds hosts the most diverse record of chondrichthian egg cases. (gasps) Wow. So sharks. Sharks do not lay eggs as we conceive of them uh, yeah. for, like, amphibians and reptiles, uh, if you'd like to explain egg cases. Yeah, sharks lay these pouches. It is it is an egg in that it has an outer protective layer, and then inside is the baby with its yolk. So it is an egg in all its parts, but it doesn't have a shell, and it is not round <laughs> like we think of eggs. They have all sorts of weird shapes and are often made to be able to be attached to things. Right, to rocks and stuff. Tassels and webbing that they stick to stuff. And then it's this leathery... It, I mean, leathery is the only way to describe yep. the texture. It is leathery pouch. When it dries, it's like dried, cured leather. <laughs> and the baby develops in here. This is what they call mermaid's purses. Yes. So not only do we get soft tissue fossils of organisms, but eggs, egg cases. And now I want to see just a collection. (laughs) I have a reference for that. I'll link it in the blog post. It's uh, I don't remember where this was from, but it's a PDF document that's just, I think, three pages or so of pictures of these egg cases. According to, I forget which reference this was out of, uh, but one of my references said that there are nine types of shark family egg cases described from Maison Creek. Wow. Which is very cool. Uh, yes, so sharks were just having a field day here. This is where the shark babies hung out. That's that's just fantastic. Do, 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 do. <laughs> Don't. How dare you? How dare you? Uh, Pfizer made me do it. <laughs> but speaking of unusual, strange, notable fossil finds from Maison Creek, we would be absolutely remiss if we did not devote a section of this episode to talk about the Tully monster. Mr. Tully. The Tully Monster is almost certainly the most famous creature of the Maison Creek fossil beds. It is one of the most famous fossil animals from North America, especially if you kick out the dinosaurs. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, very famous animal, and indeed, one of the most controversial. (laughs) A couple of papers that I read uh, made this point, which I think is phenomenal. Many similar sites. So when we we're looking at this type of site with abundant soft tissue preservation, we think of the Burgess Shale. We think of the Chengjiang fauna over in China. We might think of some of those Ediacaran sites. Those other sites, uh, Ediacaran episode 31, Burgess Shale episode 89, we are used to them being full of weird things. Yes. Maison Creek is different because the flora and fauna of Maison Creek is largely recognizable stuff. Worms, jellyfish, uh, cephalopods, it's stuff that we're familiar with. Yeah, we're recent enough now that 
really recognizable groups have established. Yes. The glaring exception to this <laughs> is the Tully monster. That's actually what I was going to say is I constantly forget how young the Tully monster is because I keep wanting to put it back in the Cambrian and yeah, stuff. Yeah, because it looks like it should come from the Cambrian. It should be there where all the other aliens this, are. It is 250 million years too late. That's dude, weird. Let me describe the Tully monster for those unfamiliar. Honestly, if you have a phone or a computer, Google the Tully monster, <laughs> yes, look it up. do yourself a favor. It has a long, slender body, uh, sort of torpedo-shaped, mm -hmm. which apparently ranges from 6 to 25 centimeters long. So a couple inches to, you know, a f almost a foot with bands along the, the, the length of it. At the back end of the body is a flat tail, like flat, uh, almost kind of dolphin tail yeah. like sort of uh, flat fin like structures uh, out to the sides, uh, which are apparently asymmetrical. <laughs> of course they are. And is typically reconstructed with sideways facing stalks that have eyes at the end of them, roughly in the front portion of the body. So two eyes, one stalk on each side sticking straight out to the sides. And at the front of its body, where you would intuit a face, it has a long proboscis with a little claw at the end of it. Yep. With little tiny teeth. Quote unquote teeth on it. A little, little uh, jaws of life crane <laughs> proboscis. It is a soft bodied animal. There is no shell. There is no, there's no bones in there. It likely, it's interpreted as a swimmer. Uh, possibly I've seen it uh, suggested Maybe swimming just above the seafloor like some squid do. Yeah, just, just grabbing wondering. stuff off the seafloor. If this sounds weird, you are right. Correct. Paleontologists have been arguing for decades about what phylum <laughs> the Tully monster belongs to. Not what family of whatever, not even what class. What phylum does this belong to? <laughs> what kind of animal we is it? it's an animal that is <laughs> yep <laughs> that's what we got <laughs> let's talk more about that here in a second but first a little bit of background on the tully monster it was first discovered uh, the first fossils were noted in 1955 by a local collector francis tully of lockport illinois and it became known before it was scientifically described as Mr. Tully's monster. Yes, and so Tully monster is the monster, not Mr. Tully. Like, right, it's, that's a common mistake. It's Tully's monster. <laughs> that's right. Or is he? <laughs> the Tully monster. Uh, about 10 years later in 1966, it was officially formally described by Eugene Richardson, the at the time the curator of fossil invertebrates at the Field Museum, who gave it the fitting name Tully Monstrum Gregarium. Nice. The Tully monster is unique to Maison Creek. It is only found in the Essex fauna, so the marine portion of the deposits. Because it, it belongs in the ocean. Because that's where <laughs> that's where you go. Yeah, you get away from our land. Because you're a weirdo. With the other weirdos. <laughs> you go hang out with the nudibranchs and yes, stuff. Yes, yes. This, this, this next fact blows my mind. The Tully monster, this species is known from thousands of specimens. <sighs> Uh, in the Brain Scoop video that I'll put in the blog post, they said that there are over 2,000 of them in the Field Museum alone. Wow. Which it really puts into perspective how weird it is. Because oftentimes when we have a fossil we can't, we have trouble identifying, it's because we've got half of one specimen. Yeah, we have such a limited supply. And we just don't have enough to make a clear ID. No, no, we've got more of these than most other fossil species by far, and we just can't do it. <laughs> We've looked at it from every angle. Literally, yeah, no, no, from the side, from the top, yep, from the bottom. Every... Twisted. And it's just gotten worse. Uh, often they are fossilized with signs of the organs, so internal structures, the eyes are there, things like that. And eventually, uh, this was in the last few decades, I think, the Tully monster was named the Illinois State Fossil. Yay! Which, that's pretty cool, Illinois. Yes. But not... I, I listen. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna poo-poo any fossils or any states. But some state fossils are definitively cooler than other state fossils. Illinois. That that this is a pretty cool one. That's a good. <laughs> There's something so so satisfying to the the ironic part of my brain that 
this is probably one of the better represented fossil organisms. Like, you Mm -hmm. know, like on just the list of things we found, this is up there. It's not only numerous, we have it in different sizes. We also have it. Gregarium. Yeah. The the, the species epithet, (laughs) Tully Monstrum Gregarium, because there's lots of them. Because there are tons. (laughs) Not only that, we also have soft tissue. Like, we have, we know their internal structure, yeah. which is something we don't know for most things we found. We understand these fossil organisms better than the vast majority of things we find in the fossil record. Yep. And it just happens to be one of the weirder, yep. <laughs> bizarre creatures. So it doesn't help. Over the years, there have been many attempts to identify where the Tully monster falls. It, one reference that I read said that over the years, it has been uh, linked to practically every bi- bilaterian phylum. <laughs> um, annelids, which are your segmented worms, nematodes, all sorts of worms, in fact. Uh, one of the probably, it sounds like the more popular suggestion is mollusks. Okay. That this is related to, uh, uh, mollusks include your bivalves, they include your gastropods, which... I would buy sea slugs. Yep, yep, yep. Cephalopods, which mm-hmm. uh, sure, I guess. <laughs> it's just it's just <laughs> a squid minus everything but the beak, <laughs> and then up and then up. Just put right it on, out there on an arm. Yep. <laughs> uh, but it's been really difficult. The reason it's difficult to identify is because no, the uh, paleontologists haven't agreed on a set of definitive traits to link it with anything else. There are possible links but there's nothing in there that we've been able to look at and go only mollusks have this feature thus it must be that yes only nematodes have this feature thus it must be that a truly diagnostic feature if you've been following the news in the last several years uh, you may have noticed that there has been a slew of recent studies that have been suggesting that the tully monster is closer to vertebrates Mm mm-hmm Notably, uh, McCoy et al. 2016 interpreted a bunch of the organs as uh, chordate-like. So the, there is a line down the center of the body of some specimens that they interpret as a notochord. Okay. The bands, which some have interpreted as segments, like an annelid worm, they suggest might be muscle bands, like in a fish, or, you know, like a lamprey has those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Clements et al. 2016 looked at the melanosomes in the eyes, so the pigment cells preserved in the eyes, and found that they are organized into distinct layers. Like, the melanosomes themselves uh, show distinct layering, which is something we see in the eyes of vertebrates. Mm -hmm. And McCoy et al. 2020 did chemical analysis of the tissues of the Tully monster and found evidence of the breakdown products so what's left of these chemicals after fossilization of proteins which is notable because invertebrate soft tissue is largely chitinous made of chitin's long chain sugars whereas vertebrate proteins are largely made of whereas vertebrate soft tissues are largely made of proteins proteinaceous Mm -hmm. and that the tully monster looks to be proteinaceous possibly linking it to vertebrates. Now, I can't just say that and pretend that everyone's on board with that. All right, case closed. Case closed, did it. (laughs) You Uh, heard it here. There have been challenges to this. There have been other researchers who have pointed out that, for example, trying to identify the organs is real tricky, that there could be different interpretations. Um, There was a study, I think in 2017, that pointed out that cephalopods also have a similar eye structure. Yeah, they do. Because of course they do. Because their eyes and our eyes are basically the same kind of eye. (laughs) Even down to those, that layering with the the pigments, so that that could be a link to mollusks, in fact. (laughs) You thought you were supporting this argument, but in fact... It was cephalopods all along. Nah, ha, ha. Do, 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 do. <laughs> and uh, researchers have also pointed out that there are features of the Tully monster body that really don't seem to be anything like fish, uh, yeah. early fish or chordates or vertebrates. So the verdict probably is still out, although there is evidence piling up in favor of a vertebrate link. Uh, I saw an article written in The Conversation by Chris Rogers that included the following quote, which I think is fantastic. The body plan of the Tully monster is so unusual in its entirety 
that it will greatly expand the diversity of whatever group it ultimately belongs to, changing the way we think about that group of animals. That's that make that's so true. Yeah, whatever <laughs> this ends up falling into, it's it's weird. Yeah, it, that it, that uh, whoever we end up classifying this with immediately increases the weirdness of that group. Yes. <laughs> By one Tully's word. Yeah, this is either a super weird mollusk or a super weird vertebrate or a super weird something else. I think that's the best way to put into perspective of what we're dealing with here is this isn't just like a weird animal. It is weird for every group. No matter no matter who we could group it with, it is almost equally weird to group it there. Yeah. Which is, and, and it was doing well. Because once again, as we're saying, often when we have a, a, a mystery you know, organism towards, I, we don't know what you were doing because you're just so unusual and we just don't have enough to truly understand you. But the other option is often you're super weird, but also there's like this one example of like, you know, you were rare or you weren't common, you know, and, and, and this group got weird and they were weird for a little bit. And then we don't have that weird group anymore, but no, this was like super successful all over the place. So would have been probably would have been a common thing if you were fishing back during this time. Yeah. You'd be catching Tully monsters all the time. Weird. I love it so much. So the Maison Creek fossil beds, utterly full of fascinating fossils, including things like the Tully monster, which we straight up don't understand. And the exciting thing about these beds is that there is so much already collected and so much still potentially to be collected that we will be learning about this place for an extremely long time. There is tons more for us to learn in the future. Well, I, I love that we've discussed before about how there are so many discoveries waiting to be made already in the collections of museums. You know, decades and decades old discoveries that just have not been looked at closely enough or looked at at all, really, since they were dug up. And I like that this is a site where that is almost more the situation than anything else. Yeah. There's so much we can still discover, and it's already indoors. <laughs> yes. Tons to work with. Oh, it is exciting. Now, before we get too far off the subject of the Tully monster, as I mentioned at the start of the episode, we take patron questions from mm -hmm. patrons at a certain level, and today we have a question regarding the Tully monster. Perfect. Will, what's that question? Our question this episode is from Lydia, who said that episode 89 got them wondering, does there seem to be any connection between Opabinia and the Tully monster, or do they just both seem to have evolved a similar unique body plan? That is an excellent question. So Opabinia is the... We've talked about Opabinia, uh, I assume, back in... Well, definitely in the Burgess Shale episode, yes. and possibly in the Cambrian Explosion episode. I'm almost positive. Episode 9. Opabinia is a Cambrian animal that is also quite small, also has this long hydrodynamic body shape and also has a long proboscis off the face with a little grabber at the end of it. Yes. And yeah, no, absolutely. But that's what comes to mind when I see the Tully monsters. I go, yeah, isn't there a Cambrian thing like that? Yep. I used to get confused uh, where I would see it, see the two and was like, are these are two different reconstructions? Like is one an older and right. one a newer <laughs> reconstruction? Then they're just real weird. But if you look up fossils and reconstructions of Opabinia, it actually looks quite different. Yes. Uh, the structure of the body is quite different. It's got the anomalocaris like uh, fans on the side of the body. Yeah, the array of fins down the side, the oars. Mm -hmm. The eyes. It's got five eyes <laughs> grouped up in front of the face. So still weird, but not, still weird. not two stock eyes. Uh, and to my knowledge, I think Opabinia has been classified as potentially a relative of arthropods, mm -hmm. which is not something that I've seen at least commonly proposed for the Tully monster. So it doesn't, and they're, you know, separated by over 200 million years with, to my knowledge, nothing in between that looks similar. No, Although, I... to be fair, there's not a lot of fossil sites that preserve things like this. Yeah, I was going to say, no other trunk-mouthed <laughs> right things. So... As far as I know, it doesn't seem like there's an overt relationship there. It does legitimately seem like this is just something that evolved a similar structure, similar body shape, and a crane mouth. Yep. Well, it's, it's, uh, I get the main difference that jumps out to me about the two is the Tully monster is a weird animal 
with a, a stock mouth. Mm-hmm. But just weird in general, whilst Opabinia looks like a weird member of the groups we find at that time. Yes. With a stock mouth. Yes. That said, the Tully monster would fit in perfectly well with the Cambrian. Oh, absolutely. Deposit like that. It would. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Yes. You would wear all the weirdos are. <laughs> I've never heard. Like, I haven't looked up either of these in detail, but I, I've heard just the bafflement of why the stock mouth, why the long. Yeah trunk mouth with a claw at the end yeah like what is how what is that doing why only one yep like what is it doing to help you which makes me wonder if this is a feature that showed up in opabinia and in the tully monster and that it was a good 200 to 250 million years between them and it has been about 300 million years (sighs) since then are we overdue who will be next to evolve a trunk mouth and will it be elephants it's my vote that would be (laughs) horrifying <laughs> that let's not just aquatic elephants and then this giant like, eight foot long <laughs> audrey two <laughs> comes out of the water <laughs> dragging beachgoers down. <laughs> on that note thank you for the question lydia thank you to everybody who requested this episode thank you to all of our patrons if you are a patron of a certain level or above, you can ask us patron questions. Um, we haven't gotten a lot of recent patron questions, which makes me worry that our patrons aren't getting the message with the link. Yeah, the correct notification. So if you are a patron at the $5 level or above, let us know if you haven't gotten the link to the f- submission form for patron questions. If you're all getting it and you just don't have questions to ask, that's fine. No judgment. Perfectly fine. We have a backlog. We've got a bunch, but also send us questions. We like to answer them. But, yeah, no, uh, I, I recently changed it to automatically send that message, um, and I'm worried I'm worried that it isn't. Yeah, so auto, auto things are always a little nerve-wracking. <laughs> let us know uh, if you are not receiving those messages, and you should be. Uh, in fact, all of our patrons, you should get a message when you uh, join. You should get an email or something. Well, all that being said, this is a fascinating fossil site. Uh, full of fascinating animals. It was a lot of fun to dive into because I w- did not know very much about Maison Creek before this. No, I, I had always heard about it and that it was this extremely noteworthy fossil deposit, but I didn't really know a lot of what was there or what kind of deposit. Like, I didn't know whether it was terrestrial or aquatic or anything. Mm-hmm. Like, didn't really know that stuff. So this has been fun learning about it. And man... What a weird place. What an amazing deposit. That's it's, so it's cool. It's the Burgess Shale of the Carboniferous. Yes, I love it. It is very cool. Listeners, thank you for joining us. Let us know what you'd like to hear about. We are always accepting requests. Go check out the blog post that we put up after each episode, which will have pictures. It'll have links to a bunch of the things that I mentioned uh, during the episode that you can go check out for more information. If you want to dive deeper... We've got uh, some sort of silver screen science coming up uh, with Godzilla vs. Kong coming out soon. And there will be more silver screen science later in the year. So if you like the bonus stuff, keep your eyes out. Thanks again to all of our patrons who get all sorts of cool goodies. If you are not a patron, you might consider becoming one. Um, Feel free to send us comments, questions, uh, requests. Leave us reviews on iTunes. Those are always nice to have. Share us with your friends. We got lots of internet chatter recently, which has been really cool. Any way you can find to support the podcast, we greatly appreciate. We release episodes every fortnight, pandemic or no. So join us in a couple of weeks for the next episode. 111. So, you know, make a wish. One, 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 one. Yeah, that, yep, yep, episode 1,111, <laughs> coming to you. When you get a roll of saying ones and it's hard to stop. Make a wish. <laughs>Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.